Hello, bonjour, buenos dias, good day, and welcome to the first in a series of webinars for the International Declaration on the Human Rights of Children in the Digital Age. I'm Doug Wood, the founder of Americans for Responsible Technology and one of the contributors to the Declaration. And it's my pleasure to welcome you from all over the world to our webinar today. We're very happy to see all of you here. We live in a perilous world, one filled with great challenges. Our hearts go out to all those who are suffering today in almost unimaginable ways, with loss, with hunger, with cold, with disease. And while we can't fix all of these problems, there are some problems we can fix, and that's what brings us together today. We are in a global struggle with giant economic forces. Those with great profits to reap are willing to take risks with our lives, and all children around the world are caught in the middle. It's up to each of us to speak truth to power, to bring light into the darkness, to challenge authority when necessary, and to stand up for those who depend completely on us to protect them. It will take time, hard work, and dedication, but eventually we will win because as my friend says, we're on the side of the angels. Over the past few weeks, more than 2,000 people from 33 countries have signed in support of this historic declaration. We've delivered a copy of the declaration to the Secretary General of the United Nations, and over the next year, we plan to deliver updated copies of the declaration with more signatories to other international meetings where the rights and welfare of children are discussed. You can find a list of those meetings on the homepage of our website at thechildrensdeclaration.org. So, yes, we are still collecting signatures, and we'll continue to do so throughout 2024. Today, we're going to hear from the primary author of the declaration, attorney Julian Gresser, and also from children's health advocates from around the world. And at the end of their presentations, we will have time for some of your questions. So please put them in the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome my friend Julian Gresser. Julian is an international public interest environmental lawyer, co-founder of Broadband International Legal Action Network, who conceived and drafted the original version of the Children's Declaration, and today is working toward its recognition and eventual adoption by the international legal community. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Julian Gresser. Thank you very much, Doug. The intention of the International Declaration is to level the playing field and to shift the burden of proof on behalf of children and their parents to the purveyors of products and services that are extracting huge profits by injuring them. So I'll make today three essential points. First, children of the digital age are at special risk now, I define risk as the probability of an event that it will occur times the damage that's at stake. And I include teenagers in the definition of children. The probability that children will be seriously injured in some way or another from electronic products, including cell phones, computers, smart meters, cell towers, in and around schools and their homes, by my estimate, must be well over 50%. And in some cases, the injuries can be fatal. The situation for children is far more egregious than for adults. Children are biologically more vulnerable. Children are far more prone to addiction. Children are dependent on adults. But the situation is becoming far worse. Children and their parents are trapped. In the case of screen time addiction, the social media companies are actually intending to harm children if we allow that addiction is a form of harm because their own computer algorithms are designed to addict. The greater the addiction, the greater the profits. Cell tower pervaders today are regularly locating cell towers within prop school properties and in some cases in playgrounds and on top of buildings. School administrators are permitting this situation. 
We know because Doug and Patty have uh, a project, Tech Safe Schools, where they sent out over 300 inquiries, invitations to collaborate. I don't know whether one school administrator took responsibility for the risk he or she was imposing on children under their care. These school administrators are permitting the situation either because they fear of being sued by the companies or because they are being given grants to accelerate wireless deployment in schools. The federal and state governments in the US and other countries are accelerating wireless dependent infrastructure, which will greatly increase, increase the risk to children. And finally, there's no available relief for children and parents. Affordable insurance from, a reputa, from reputable insurance companies is not available and no administrative system exists to provide relief or compensations. Moreover, the courts have not been receptive, even when parents have, and this is few parents, the limited financial means to litigate. In short, 100% of the risks are on children and their families. I got into this business of writing this declaration because of this situation. It screams for some sort of serious concerted attention. My second point is the declaration is intended to affirm the basic proposition that the intentional inju injury and exploitation of children, here we're highlighting screen time addiction and illnesses associated with continuous and cumulative EMF exposure from wireless devices that this situation violates the basic human rights of the child recognized by the UN European and other conventions, as well as the international customary law. This is very important. I may just drop a note here that the sources of international law are decisions by the International Court of Justice, conventions, international treaties, and so forth, and what is called customary law, which is sort of so basic that it constitutes a legal basis for action. I'm saying, and we're saying in this declaration that the protection of children from harm, from intentional harm from these wireless devices or the, in the digital age is, has become uh, a basis of international customary law. And that customary law as recognized in many countries is self-actualizing. -act self-executing. In other words, it is a basis, customary law, for legal action in national courts and international agencies and tribunals. My final point, third, next steps. The declaration is designed to provide a collaborative framework for legal, administrative, and grassroots actions that can be immediately implemented, taking advantage of the following. The offenses that are being committed and the injuries inflicted are similar. The legal theories are in common and the defendants in some of these cases are identical or at least of the same basic breed. My organization, BB Elon, in collaboration with uh, Americans for Responsible Technology, Children's Health Defense and other groups around the world is willing to assist parties in the following action, joint actions, joining the or filing amicus briefs in screen time addiction cases in the US or supporting foreign parties in litigating these cases abroad on the same legal theories. The case is being filed in California in the federal courts and, and state courts advance legal theories that can be, can be adopted and form the basis for legal actions in Europe in Asia and around the world. They're compelling. Providing strategic and tactical advice and negotiations, assisting in preparing ordinances and draft laws, preparing testimony and appearing on behalf of international tribunals. And finally, launching in March 24, an international skills training program designed to enable advocates to strengthen their integral resilience, the capacity to turn these horrors, this adversity, the tactical advantage 
their life force, integral resilience is a life force in navigating these formidable challenges. Conclusion, children and their parents in every community are bearing the entire risks of digital products and services without being informed and without their consent and for the profits of the purveyors of these products. This is a fundamental miscarriage of justice and human rights that affects all children. An evolutionary shift in values is required where the protection of children who are stewards of future generations comes first. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, so much for that. Uh, a reminder, Julian is the primary author of the Children's Declaration and was his big idea that caused all this work for me. Just kidding. All, all this trouble. All this trouble. Um, I'm delighted now to introduce uh, two of our friends from Canada, uh, Frank Clegg and Shelley Wright. Frank is the founding CEO of Canadians for Safe Technology, the co-chair of the Business Advisory Group to the Environmental Health Trust and former president of Microsoft Canada. And Frank will be followed by Shelley Wright, a retired teacher, director of Canadian Educators for Safe Technology, a guest speaker for two accredited medical symposiums, and one who has passed successful resolutions at the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario annual meetings. Frank, I give it to you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I want to thank and congratulate Julian, yourself, and the rest of the team that put this amazing document together. Uh, we all hope and pray that it will have an impact and provide better protection for children around the world. I want to talk a, a bit about um, the Declaration, but first I thought I'd just give two minutes of my background. I have spent my entire career in the technology industry, and I got involved over a decade ago and understood and starting to understand the significant impact that technology and the misuse of technology has on all of us. That's why I helped co-found Canadians for Safe Technology, a national organization that focuses on raising awareness and educating parents and teachers and all individuals about how to use the technology more safely and also working with all levels of government to provide better protection for our, our environment. Um, I, I want to talk about three areas. The first is to talk about the overlap with the declaration with the focus that C4ST has had for over the last decade. I'm encouraged to see that. Most of us are aware our guidelines, particularly in North America, are, are not protective. In fact, uh, we quote the, uh, the fact that China and Russia have guidelines that are 50 times safer than our guidelines that we have in North America. We, uh, we are encouraged and support the broad education. A lot of parents that I talk to, they have an inherent understanding that the technology is probably not good for their children, but they really don't know what to do about it. And so this, this raising awareness. And I'm also encouraged that our, that our healthcare professionals are sadly misinformed or uninformed of the potential harmful effects. So anything that we can do to continue to raise that awareness can only help us. Um, what we're going to do with the declaration, and Doug had asked us to talk about what's new or what, how we can use it, is to use this as a way to expand our horizons. We've focused primarily in the past on the, on the impacts of wireless radiation and non-ionizing non, uh, non radiation. This gives us a chance to go back to all educators and all parents and teachers and talk about not only the wireless radiation impact, but also to talk about the addiction issues and, and, to, and the social gaming and the fact that this technology is actually created to, as Julian had said, to, to cause you to spend more time on it. I think I'm encouraged to say every child, every person, but every child particularly has the right to expect to be living and going to school in a safe environment. And I think the onus is on us as the adults, whether it's the parents, or grandparents or the educators to provide that environment. And I think it behooves all of us to do that. And we're encouraged about using this declaration, as they say, to launch this, this campaign at the educators and the administrators, but also at the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles. Finally, uh, these are the things I'd love to be able to get into. I'm, I've been talking about uh, this issue for quite some time now. It's getting, at, you know, as, a, as the old adage is, follow the money. And the money all ends up in the coffers and in the shareholders' pockets of the technology companies and the telecommunication companies. And I think we have to shift this. Right now, 
my old industry has this amazing benefit that they don't have to prove their technology is safe. Unlike the pharmaceutical or the chemical or the automotive industries who have to do that, this industry gets a bit of a free pass. So I think we have a chance to change those rules. And also I think, you know, as the tobacco industry is seeing, they are now responsible and accountable and financially liable for the harm that their that their products are doing are causing, and I think there's an opportunity with this declaration to to join forces to do that. And finally, um, I think you know we're seeing an amazing change in expectations of corporations with the whole movement to green energy and a safe environment. And I'm encouraged at some point, someday we'll hold account the responsible uh, the organizations directly responsible and accountable themselves. So I thank you again for the opportunity. Shelley, I'll turn it over to you for, for your comments. And thank you everyone, Julian Gresser and others that were part of this, uh, creating this declaration. It is absolutely fantastic and very comprehensive and legally grounded. Canadian Educators for Safe Technology uh, is committed to immediately implement the protections in this international declaration with school communities, unions, governments, and public health authorities. We work with students and staff injured by wireless radiation. This user-friendly declaration will increase responses to calls to action. We are committed to actively use this declaration to address government infractions that unnecessarily expose children to wireless radiation. We are concerned about the lack of rigorous pre-market testing of neurotoxic wireless products. We are concerned about acute and chronic adverse effects from non-consensual wireless exposures in schools. Commercial exploitation creates infringement of personal privacy as student engagement is monitored and personal details harvested for use by companies. Inadequate health guidelines fail to consider children's vulnerabilities, cumulative exposures, medically vulnerable persons, and leads to neglect of duty to accommodate. Inadequate guidelines undermine support for legitimate workplace work refusals. We will actively use this declaration to promote new health and physical education curriculum documents. Unions can use this declaration to initiate safe tech best practices and address addictive gaming. We see an opportunity for public health authorities to use this declaration to inform families about the risks of wireless products and offer guidance. This declaration enables us to inspire non-governmental organizations to encourage manufacturers to avoid child labor. NGOs can help us advocate for RF-reduced, wired school environments, improved health guidelines, assessment, monitoring, regulation of wireless products, and enhanced product safety. Thank you for this comprehensive, legally grounded declaration. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Shelley. Amazing work that you guys are doing in Canada. Congratulations to you, and thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, for those who are really worried at how fast Shelly went through her slides, I'm going to put her slide deck up on the website so that you can go through it at your leisure and get all the information that she has there. Um, I'm happy now to introduce to you Eileen O'Connor from England. She is the co-founder and charity director for the EM Radiation Research Trust, co-founder and board member of the International EMF Alliance. Uh, and former member of the European Commission Stakeholder Dialogue Group on EMF. Eileen O'Connor, welcome to our program. Thank you, Doug, for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, I have a presentation as well that I'd like to share. Okay, I, I'd like to start with advice from the previous Health Protection Agency Chairman, Sir William Stewart. Sir William Stewart was the chief scientific advisor to the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, and then he was called upon by Tony Blair's government to examine mobile phones, foam masts and the impact on our health. The, the clear advice from Sir William Stewart to the government on mobile foam masts was that he couldn't rule out biological effects as a, a, 
as cognitive fu function, cancer inductions, or molecular biology changes within the cells. And he, he said the beam of the greatest intensity should never fall on any part of the school grounds unless the school and parents agreed. In memory of Jenny Fry, these are the real faces of people who've suffered. In 2015, a 15-year-old electrosensitive schoolgirl, Jenny Fry, committed suicide. Jenny was suffering from tiredness, headaches and bladder problems when exposed to Wi-Fi at school. Her mother accused the school of failing to protect her. Since then, we've had a successful electrosensitivity court claim for a child in the UK. In 2022, the upper tribunal ruled that the council must secure a special educational provision for a child who has electro hypersensitivity, in particularly sensitive to Wi-Fi. The Judge Jacobs found that the child should be considered disabled by her condition under the Equality Act 2010 and that, and that she required an education, health and health care plan. We should be demanding the removal of Wi-Fi in schools, a precious life lost and a court decision to protect another child suffering with electrosensitivity to Wi-Fi. How many children are suffering due to this exposure to this technology today? And what will it take before our government carries out their duty of care? It's time for action. We can no longer allow this sort of suffering. There's a whole list of conditions here. People should ask the school to provide a risk assessment and indemnity insurance to protect against claims for health effects in connection with Wi-Fi and radiation and use the International Children's Declaration. It's absolutely brilliant that we've got this available now to use. Phone mast applications that are not fit for purpose. Um, campaigners in the UK have uncovered a whole load of errors contained within the flawed ICNERP certificates. Many of the documents submitted to planning on behalf of operators contain incorrect site addresses, incorrect company addresses, including names of companies that don't exist. The Radiation Research Trust recently supported residents in Birmingham writing to Pre-Gill Pre MP and Birmingham City Council calling for the removal of a foam mast due to errors contained in the planning application. Preet Gill has since been in touch to say she has now submitted parliamentary questions and is writing to the minister to express her concerns. Also call for risk assessments, confirming inspections that have been done on the sites uh, in, for searches of underground electricity cables, underground gas pipes and sewerage systems, calling on the health and safety exec executive to investigate object against the masts. There's a health, safety and well-being liability issue for telecom and local authorities. There's a link here to a document written by a UK solicitor. Local authorities in the UK can include health considerations for masts, despite what they're being told by central government. In November 21, the planning court a planning court had a successful claim against Brighton and Hove Council with Hutchinson 3G. The Honourable Judge Holgate overturned a local planning authority approval for a 5G mass to be sited close to a primary school. The ruling found that the council failed to address the impacts of the mast. And the right to opt out for smart meters I recently sent a letter of complaint to the UK government and the Freedom of Information calling for liability cover for smart meters. The government has admitted that they don't hold this information. Richard Vobes invited me to re review my first letter of complaint on his YouTube chat channel, reaching over 46,000 people. And then I was then invited for an interview with Richard reaching over 33,000 people since the 3rd of November. I called for everyone to write to their MP, providing an action pack of information on the Radiation Research Trust website. And people throughout the UK are now writing to MPs and energy providers, with many receiving support from their MPs 
and successfully refusing or negotiating the removal of the smart meters. The action pack now includes the International Children's Declaration. I'd like to end just by saying we need to fight for the rights of our children. No child should be allowed to suffer for the sake of big business or wireless technology. Remembering children who are no longer with us today, such as Jenny Fry and Hal, who is featured in this photograph, a beautiful eight-year-old girl from Liverpool who died on the 31st of May 2019 from an aggressive high-grade malignant brain tumour. So I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to speak and for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen, um, for all you are doing in England. It's remarkable. Um, you, uh, errors in errors in applications. Whoever heard of such a thing? <laughs> Uh, happens all the time, and sharp-eyed people have been able to stop mm -hmm. installations through careful analysis of those applications. So thank you for reminding us about that. Wynne McLean is the founder and managing director of EMF Australia, the country's foremost expert on electromagnetic exposures in homes, businesses, and learning environments. And I had the pleasure of uh, recording an interview with her because I think it's like four o'clock in the morning. So uh, although she's a good sport, she didn't want to, didn't want to join us. So um, here's my interview with Lynn McLean. Hi, I'm Lynn McLean from EMR Australia, and I'm speaking to you from sunny Sydney. Well, it's not so sunny today. And uh, we thought you might like a picture of one of our beautiful beaches to start with. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about me and my involvement in this issue uh, in electromagnetic radiation. I started in 1996 with what was called then the EMR Alliance of Australia, and it was a small committee that was part of an environment group that morphed in 2002 to the EMR Association of Australia. So we've evolved over time. And in those two organisations, I was involved in letters to politicians, lobbying visits to politicians, to our national capital, writing lots of articles. And you can see on the right, the very first newsletter that I ever wrote about electromagnetic radiation, and that was in March 1996. And the one on the left is the evolution of this. This is in 2020. This to me is a really important part of my work because I'm very keen to look at the research, try and crystallise the research and get that information out to people. One of the other things I've done is to write four books. So you can see them here. These are some of the activities that I was involved in. Uh, down the bottom on the right, you can see this was a committee that developed a, the code of practice for the deployment of radio communications infrastructure for Australia. At the top here, you can see this is another committee we developed a local government planning instrument for the siting of mobile phone towers. So this was a model DCP that could guide councils as to what they should do if uh, somebody applies to put a mobile phone tower up in, in that council area. Basically, you can say that our authorities speak nothing bad about wireless radiation, despite the evidence that it may be harmful, hear nothing against it, and see nothing against it. So fairly disappointing, but the, um, the end result of that for me is to demonstrate that if we want to make changes on this issue, it's up to us as individuals and as, as groups to make the changes because we're, we're certainly not going to get a good outcome from our authorities in Australia anyway. 2003, I got to a bit of a crisis point. I got to the point where either I had to get a proper job or I had to make my work um, able to support me. So I started EMR Australia, which is a business. And this is my website here. And what it does is it provides information, services and products to help people reduce their exposure and understand their exposure to uh, electromagnetic fields and radio frequency radiation. Now, in terms of the International Declaration on the Human Rights of Children in the Digital Age, firstly, I want to congratulate you on this because I think that this is a hugely important 
document. Now, one of the reasons I think it's important is because who does not want to support the human rights of children? And I think that if you were to ask most people in the world whether they would agree with what's in this document, I think most people would be agreeable. Now, why else do I think it's important? Well, it's endorsed by some heavyweights. There are a lot of legal experts and there are a lot of health experts and scientists who really know the science on this issue who are talking in this document. I also like it because I think that it takes a multi-pronged approach, which makes it much harder to argue. So, for example, it's not just talking about wireless radiation. It's also talking about screen addiction. And most of us know the problems with screen addiction. And I think probably most people know because most families are probably struggling with some aspects of that themselves. It also talks about the commercial exploitation of children and the social and environmental impacts of mining minerals in poor countries using child labour. All of these issues are covered in this declaration and all of these are issues that I think are hugely important to to the world and to, to all of us. I think that it has another advantage in that this declaration is now something that because of all of those things and because of its credibility can be used by people like me, by uh, people who might want to talk to their schools about their concerns about wireless device use, who might want to talk to their businesses, who might want to talk to their councils. This is an, a, doc, a document that has some authority that can be a really important resource. How do I see myself being able to promote this? Well, what we've done already is to promote it in one of our blog posts, which you can see here. And uh, this is a post that gets sent to our network by email. And it is also distributed on our social media pages, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Telegram. We also run training programs. We've got online training. We've got a Zoom training program coming up next year. And this is another opportunity for us to let people know about this, this document and give them an opportunity to endorse it or perhaps to use it in their networks too. So I hope that all of that will be helpful. And I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to talk to you from Australia about this issue. Lynn McLean from the uh, uh, EMF Australia. I thought it was very interesting, actually, that she found a way to support herself in her activity, in her activist work by uh, providing information and products to people uh, that can help them. Um, I want to turn now to Pernille Shriver. Pernille is one of the contributors to the declaration. We were happy to have her on a couple of, uh, of our conference calls as we were putting this together. Uh, she is an educated biologist, international coordinator for the Danish EHS Association, and vice chair of Europeans for Safe Connections. We're so happy to have you here, Pernille. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Doug. And... I am allowed to share now. First of all, of all uh, uh, I will very much thank you uh, for the hard work you've done with the declaration. It is an amazing job. And I think it's a, a really good tool in many ways. Um, and um, what I will uh, um, talk about here is what we have done so far in Europeans for Safe Connections. And as uh, you introduced me uh, as vice chair of Europeans for, uh, for Safe Connections and also international coordinator for the Danish EHS Association. And that is um, a reason why um, I have made these two titles um, uh, visible for you because I will just uh, give a little explanation what Europeans for Safe Connection actually is because we are a pretty new um, alliance we started in May this year, and we are Alliance of Euro European Organizations. And uh, we also have uh, one of uh, our members present today, uh, Jürgen uh, Goodbeer from uh, Diagnosefunk, is also uh, a member of Europeans for Safe, uh, Europeans for, for Safe Connections. And uh, what we do is um, we, we 
get together and and we work for understanding and acceptance of EMF uh, as a harmful to all life. Uh, and we also work for better regulation on EMF by um, European and national policymakers. We really try to get um, um, in talk with uh, the European uh, Parliament, a, a politician at the U European Parliament. And also we uh, defend groups that are sensitive to EMF, uh, EHS people, children and pregnant women. So it's, this is just to, to give you an idea what Europeans for Safe Connection is. And um, this is the first uh, action we have done with the declaration. This letter has been sent to all 31 member organizations. And uh, as we are an uh, umbrella organization, then we have potential thousands of members that uh, could actually uh, help us um, uh, share this, uh, this important letter. And uh, this letter contains uh, action um, that everybody can do all our members can do. So what we do is that we urge our members to ask as many uh, doctors, experts, lawyers, uh, organizations to sign the declaration. We also ask them to translate um, to other languages and than you have done. You have done a, a pretty good job translating into a couple of the European languages because that is one of the main struggle we have in Europe is that when we have to share among all the European uh, uh, countries, not only the EU countries, but the uh, European countries, we have to translate uh, all our documents. So that is very good that you have translated it into uh, different languages. And uh, then we ask our members to translate the declaration and send it to politicians and organizations and authorities and so on. And also, contact by phone. Because one thing we have learned um, with working uh, in this topic here is that it's not uh, usually not enough just to send an email. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to also try to get hold of, of authorities and politicians by phoning them. So this is the, the action that we actually urge our, our members to do at the moment. Um, and as I said to, um, to Julian and Doc in the beginning, uh, uh, before the, the, the meeting here, was that it is very uh, clever that the declaration has screen time addiction and screen time as the first issue, because we can see now in Europe, the debate is really, really building up. Um, this week, I think, or it was last week, the PISA result came out and uh, they were not too good for the students in Sweden. They did not make uh, the same score as three years ago in reading and math. So the Swedish politician have pushed forward to ban smartphones in school. So they will eliminate the, the disturbance that smartphones can do during education and, and classroom time. And in Denmark, we have uh, had a debate on screen time addiction for a year or a year and a half now. And it has been led by a well-known doctor that is recognized by our politicians. So what we see now in Denmark is that our Minister of Education has initiated debates and decision processes about screen time and smartphones in schools. We have not have had any polit uh, political decisions yet, but what it has uh, uh, ended up with is that several schools all over Denmark has decided to reduce screen time uh, by books again, instead of uh, only have uh, iPads and computers. That's a good thing. Um, use the computer less during classroom time and put away the smartphones. So it has actually led to, to very positive things in Denmark. And uh, we see in Spain that the parent groups has demanded smartphones out of the classroom. That is not uh, something we see in Denmark or have seen in, in Sweden. That is the parents that are demanding the smartphones out of the classroom. So that is uh, different. Um, you see different uh, origins of, of changes have, uh, have uh, been popping up during uh, all over Europe. Um, in Europeans for Safe Connections, we have members from, from all over Europe, and one of the members from Slovakia has made this web page, web, website, where you can see um, 
uh, what um, uh, initiatives have been taken in the different countries. So you have a map over Europe and all the uh, countries with the with the red uh, circle with the cross on has banned the smartphones. And there's also um, a, a, a list of countries and you can click on the link so you can follow up what is going on in the different countries in, in Europe. So that is uh, that is very uh, interesting um, website to, to look at. Um, so that is what is going on at the moment in Europe. And thank you for listening. And if you want to know more about what we're doing, Europeans for Safe Connection, and read about what we're doing with the um, decoration, please go to our website or you can uh, write me or uh, Camille Bartuchek. So uh, he's also working with the declaration uh, for Europeans for Safe Connection. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Pernil. That's really terrific. Um, what you're doing in Europe, and that's hopefully we can manage that on a worldwide scale as well. Um, I want to turn now to Japan. Uh, my friend Miho Yamaguchi is a university professor in Japan who was forced to retire because of the increasing electro smog on the campuses where she taught. She is a member of Japan EMF Action. And again, she's uh, far on the other side of the world. And so uh, I asked her if we could have an interview. We did one, I put some subtitles on it so you can make sure you understand what she has to say. Here's my, uh, my interview with uh, Miho Yamaguchi. Hello, I'm Miho Yamaguchi, a member of Japan EMF Action. About five years ago, I became sensitive to EMF after a small cell base station was installed near my home. At the time, I was a lecturer at uh, Kyushu University and Kurumi University, but the increasing electoral smog on the campuses due to the installation of additional Wi-Fi access points and so on, eventually made it impossible for me to continue working. As soon as I realized that I had developed EM sensitivity, I began gathering the information about the health effects of EMF exposure. I shared what I learned with my students, as well as with some consumer groups and politicians. It was during this time that I learned about Japan EMF Action and joined them. Japan EMF Action is an NGO dedicated to fostering a society where those who suffer from health effects caused by environmental EMF are supported and where such health effects are prevented. It was founded in 1996. Their activities include negotiating with government agencies and corporations. They have successfully prevented the installation of cell-based stations and have also removed some that were already installed, totaling 295 to date. In terms of smart meters, Japan EMF Action has engaged in repeated negotiations with the Agency for Natural Resources and Energy, as well as the Tokyo Electric Power Company. They have also sent urgent letters to electric power companies across the nation. As a result, electric power companies in Japan now respond to customers by removing the transmitters from their smart meters when so demanded. In some cases, customers were able to keep their analog meters. Thanks to the tremendous efforts of conscientious scientists worldwide, there is mounting evidence of the non-thermal effects of radio frequency radiation. With their kindest professional supports, I was able to write an extensive report on the EMF Medical Conference 2021 and presented at the conference of the Japanese Society of Clinical Ecology and how it published in the Society Journal. Regarding the use of Wi-Fi in schools, I collaborated with Ms. Yasuko Kato, representative of the Life Environmental Network and others. We had an interview with officials from the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. They responded by stating that the use of paper textbooks is mandatory, while the use of digital textbooks is optional. However, much to our dismay, they also said that 
has for the use of Wi-Fi at school, it was up to the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. In Japan, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications continues to deny the non-thermal effects of radio frequency radiation, citing the hazardous guidelines of ICNIO and so on as a pretext. Likewise, an organization, Japan EMF Information Center, pretends that if everyday exposure to radio frequency radiation were harmless and vigorously propagates this erroneous assertion. The center consists of a director and five staff members, and each of the five staff members is seconded from an electric power company. Despite its claim, it is not a neutral organization. The problems of ever-growing EMF health effects and EMF safety frauds are hardly covered in Japanese media. The International Declaration on the Human Rights of Children in the Digital Age points out that parents remain uninformed about the risk of EMF exposure. This is also the case in Japan, and children are left unprotected. Alarmingly, developmental disorders such as ADHD are skyrocketing. In addition, the number of children with chemical sensitivities is rapidly increasing in Japan. I suspect that this is also related to the exponentially increasing radio frequency radiation in the environment, because it has been pointed out that EMF exposure can have synergetic effect with chemical exposure. It is imperative that we, as global citizens, collaborate to address this serious problem. So let us unite for the International Declaration on the Human Rights of Children in the Digital Age and gain momentum to disseminate the truth about EMF health effects, as well as the commercial exploitation of privacy and human rights. In each region and all over the world, let us strive to reach a tipping point. We shall overcome. Thank you very much. Gotta love Miho Yamaguchi. She's just an amazing person. I was so happy to have that video from her. Um, I'm gonna turn now to my friend, Mary Ann Tierney, uh, an RN, MPH, all kinds of degrees. She's the director of Safe Tech North Carolina. She's certified by the Building Biology Institute as an electromagnetic radiation specialist. She's a mover and shaker in our world in the United States. Mary Ann, welcome. Thank you, Doug. I am so grateful to be here with you all. And I am humbled to be in this international body when I am just working at the state level. But thank you to you and to Julian for this incredible document marrying both our concerns about screen addiction and wireless radiation exposure. I come to you not only as a professional doing this work, um, educating and also doing mitigation, in people's homes when they are suffering, but also as a mom of a 12 year old. And when my son was preparing to enter school, I met first with a team of school nurses, 25 of them who were deeply interested in what they were being exposed to and what children were being exposed to. And last week we presented the declaration, which you can see on the top left, to um, this statewide conference of hundreds of school nurses. And we were able to talk to about 300 of them. And we also shared a handout that's gonna be available to you all on the common symptoms, interventions that nurses can take. And they always wanna know what is actionable, what can I do and the reliable science. And we also had a poster of the most common symptoms related to wireless radiation exposure. 99% of nurses who had been there for five years or more agreed that these common symptoms have indeed increased in the five years since children have had one-to-one -one mobile devices available to them in schools. 
Um, there was a lot of relief that the nurses expressed that they finally have some sense about why all these symptoms have increased. They were very interested to know how they could protect themselves. And many of them talked to me individually about their own symptoms or their children's symptoms. Um, and then they were expressing a lot of grave concerns about what, how their school administrators would handle this information that they were learning. And so we shared with them um, the link to our recent webinar on Tech Safe Schools. Um, Doug and Julian were also faculty of this webinar, turning down the dial on wireless radiation in schools. And while we know that ethernet um, is the best option for accessing the internet in schools, the reality is that all of these wireless access points in schools are vastly overpowered and there are very simple solutions that they can take. And so um, it was Tech Safe Schools Mitigation Guide that served as the foundation for the solutions and Doug is gonna make that available to you all. And you can see the one hour and 15 minute long recording of this webinar at safetechnc.org. I will tell you that um, there is one county in North Carolina, a school district that has already implemented um, since Doug's earlier webinars on this, um, implemented a number of very concrete and simple ways to reduce the power from the wireless access points. And I was stunned when I did an informal assessment in four classrooms recently. The building biology standard is we want these classrooms, we want our environments to be below a thousand microwatts for them to not be extreme. It would be better for them to be 10 or 100 according to the European Academy of Environmental Medicine but I was glad to see that three of these four classrooms were 326 microwatts or less, and only one of them was higher, and that's because the teacher's laptop was on. So if the teacher has a hardwired laptop, if the children are using books and we're sitting right under the wireless access point, this is a far better situation. What I will often find right under the access point is 25,000 microwatts or more, and typically over a million when there are multiple devices being powered in the classroom. Um, we've also shared the declaration with the Screen Strong community. This is a North Carolina-based nonprofit that serves families and individuals worldwide. They have a number of phenomenal podcasts, books, and online courses um, that both parents and students can take. They also have ambassadors all over the world um, at these where these little dots are. And the 95 of us can present on the effects on screens. And I'm very pleased to share with you that they've recently approved me to serve as one of their ambassadors primarily to be a bridge, to be a resource for these other ambassadors to learn about wireless radiation. All of them agree that wireless radiation is a problem, but they have not taken this on because it is just too enormous. So I'm so honored to be able to help them bridge this. And the, um, the declaration today is a testament to us bringing these two worlds together. I also believe that this ambassador program could share could be an important model for those of us doing this work on wireless radiation to be able to have central sources for training, for materials, for ongoing support um, in order to make sure that we're doing this education well and with others. I'm also gonna be sharing with you another resource. Um, Doug is gonna have this up on the website. Pediatric neurologist, Rusty Turner from South Carolina has um, published um, a textbook chapter in this neurology medical journal, this neurology textbook um, for medical students. And um, it will be a great resource for you to share with any English speaking or English reading healthcare practitioner about better brain health. And he includes in there this acronym, MEDS, 
uh, move daily, exercise for better brain health, eat to improve gut health, disconnect from screens, blue light, and wireless radiation, and good sleep hygiene. And we know that sleep hygiene also means keeping a phone away from the bed, both for the screen effect and not having the blue light and for the radiation effect. So for any of you watching, if you have children in your life, um, please consider reaching children with a small battery powered alarm, alarm clock or anyone that you know. I was stunned right before the pandemic shut down. It's nearly four years ago. I was teaching to sixth graders who were learning about the electromagnetic radiation special, um, spectrum. There were 150 of them and, and two thirds of them admitted that they use their cell phone as their alarm clock. And if there's one place in the world in, at, in, during the day that we can help protect children easily, that is in the bedroom where they are most vulnerable to being able to recover and um, face the, the um, exposures of the day. Another great opportunity to, to share on both the effects of screens and wireless radiation is the upcoming Global Day of Unplugging, um, Friday, March 1st to 2nd from sundown to sundown. Um, this, um, the website um, called um, the, I'm sorry, unpluggedcollaborative.org has a number of places where you can actually put in an unplugged event and that can be public or private. Um, the private events obviously don't have a, an address attached. You could put something like we're having unplugged dinner at home or something very simple in public, like, you know, we're meeting at a local coffee shop to chat and, um, and not have our phones out or we're having a scavenger hunt in our front yard, or we're meeting at the library to discuss a great book about this topic, right? There's lots of different things that could be done on the global day of unplugging. Last year um, in Asheville, North Carolina, a team of us were at a popular farmer's market and spoke to a couple hundred of people on this day. Um, a local building biologist, Diana Schultz, shared her um, wireless radiation meter and how the wireless was um, registering the radiation on the phones people were carrying in their pockets. My son, pictured below, was handing out handouts that had ideas for what people can do on their unplugged day, and on the back side, some safer ways to use their cell phone and reliable science. That flyer, um, both of these um, are in um, that I've shared are in uh, Word format, and you can excuse me, take them and modify them for your own use. The Unplug Collaborative um, does not acknowledge effects on the body. They do acknowledge effects on mental health and on the eyes, but if you can take 10 minutes and reach out to them on their contact page and encourage them to include effects on the body, uh, that might take us farther in this journey. I want to share that um, one of my favorite theologians, Dr. Barbara Brown Taylor, um, was asked the question recently, what is saving your life? What is saving your life? And I realized in reflecting on her podcast that the answer was really you all, that it's you doing this work, me knowing that we are part of a bucket brigade, that we don't know how our efforts will affect the next generation after, after us, but let's keep passing the bucket anyway. Thank you all so much for having me today and for this work you are doing. Thank you, Marianne. Good work for all, your, all the things you're doing. Uh, I love the farmer's market. We run one here in our town. It's a great idea. We'll take our meter down there and show people what their phones actually are doing. Um, I'm happy now to turn to now to Jorn Goupier. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He's a freelance architect, a building biologist with 12 years of experience in municipal council work, and he is chairman of the name I love most. It's called Diagnose Funk, which translates to Diagnose Wireless. 
but it, it it means great things in English too. So so many people are affected that way. Jorn, I give it to you. So. Yes, thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, diagnose of funk. Um, it's funky stuff for you, but um, <laughs> the issue by itself it's uh, quite hardcore and. Yes, I'm presenting an environmental and protection uh, consumer organization. And we're taking care about this hot issue of wireless um, um, devices and, and everything which is about uh, high frequency radiation. And our organization is now online uh, since 2009. And we are the leading organization in the German speaking countries, Switzerland, Austria, and also affecting um, Belgium and uh, countries like this. We also do a lot of translation work from English into German and also backwards. And uh, actually, already we made an insect study, the biggest one it's ever been um, uh, uh, published, um, not a study by itself, it's a meta analyze of what is on the market. And so um, uh, it's quite wide what, where we are working on. We are working on, um, on the consumer protection and giving advices and also having this political discussion about what's going on outside and why is nothing changing in this issue. And so I have just a few slides um, about where we are in. And one of the most uh, important thing is, I don't know if everybody knows uh, that the base of IGNUR is in the German uh, official radiation and the Federal Office's Office of Radiation Protection there IGNUB is located and the German government is giving the most money, 100,000 euro per year, per year for the work of IGNUB. And so the person who is the secretary of IGNUB is also uh, responsible to, um, to give the, the parliament um, their view on wireless radiation. So, Therefore, it is quite easy to understand why it is so difficult in Germany to get a little move into the direction to, to change the radiation, uh, the, the limits or something like this. So in the moment, there is no parliamentary group in the Bundestag, uh, which is working on this theme, which is, which is trying to understand that there's a problem. And so that's why they are, perfectly organized on the governmental level that the IGNURB is part of this um, uh, Federal Office of Radiation Protection. And so this makes us for us so difficult um, to, to get through and to change something. And so here's just one um, uh, publication we made about it. Um, what is, uh, who interprets, inter interprets the risk and how they do it and how they be able to, to get uh, rid of our arguments. And this is, uh, um, yeah, one of the big things we are, have to figure, I have to face here. And just for the people who don't know um, much about this, um, about this uh, argumentation, just a few words on this slide about the electromagnetic spectrum we always use uh, when we have public um, talks. And because it's so easy to understand that we have a problem with it. And if you present the electromagnetic spectrum like this, that we see that there are just big gaps. And now we are in the way that everything is filled up with some artificial devices, with some artificial um, uh, um, things we are, we are using. And we are talking about this little part of this um, big spectrum. And we know about the development which is going on. We're going to 6G. And we're also talking about 7G. We just name it like this. This is part of the solution when we use um, <clears throat> uh, the, the infrared uh, spectrum um, for uh, wireless devices. And so if you present something like this for people who, who are not involved in this theme, it's quite easy to understand. The evolutionary level where we come from, if you just present these figures that we see here with all these zeros, 
And where we are now with the artificial um, um, use of, of wireless technology, we see this gap makes it so easy to understand that there will be a problem uh, for everything on Earth because there was nothing before here around. This is one, this is the main part where Diagnose Funk is working about. And the other part we are taking care of, it's just a side part, is about the, uh, the screen time issue. And already we made a new, um, we put up a new interview online, uh, which I, um, uh, I, yeah, it would be good if you, if you can uh, take a look on it. It's, um, this is the old interview with this Dr. Dr. Gertrude Teuchert Not. Um, uh, she is head of the department of, was head of the department of neuroanatomy and human biology in Bielefeld University and researches the consequences of sensory overload, addiction mechanism, and the connection between movement, learning, and the brain. And she makes very hard, it gives very hard advices uh, about this issue. And if you take a look into her work, you will easily understand why, how the damage is set on the very, very deep level on brain development. And she gives big explanation on it, very, not easy to understand, but um, it's a full range of uh, argumentation you find there. If you read some of her papers, you will understand easily that giving children screen time and a lot of screen time that it, that way will be affected on the deepest level on their brain development. And this is so important to understand. And then you will take action that something has to be changed. And just one more slide to give you an, uh, an impression of what we publish. We publish quite a lot of uh, articles also um, analyzes and the, the consumer advices in these um, in our papers. And if anybody on the world wants to use some of our stuffs, we we give all these papers out for free. We can support you by having all these pictures and stuff like this to translate all this work we have already done. And so that you can use it in your country, like also uh, like already Chile is now doing it. And also in Brazil, we have some translation going on uh, into Spanish. And one more thing to, uh, to give you an uh, to, to let you know is growing up healthy in the world of digital media. This book we have given out in 2018, um, also, uh, Professor Teuchert Not was in there, and it is now translated into 20 languages. And I will give you all the links you have seen on the paper on the on the sh on the sheets here um, shortly um, in the chat room where we find the links. Yeah, thank you for your initiative, and uh, we will try to use it as good as possible, and we will see if we can make a movement forward to more protection for children and everybody on the world and everything on the world which is alive. Thank you. Thank you, Jorn. Very inspiring to hear about your organization and all the great things you are doing. So thank you for being part of our, our program today. And I'm happy to introduce now to you Dr. Marlena Kruger, who is the CEO and founder of Mind Unique Education, and the Techno Life Wise Foundation. She is a digital well being and integrative health coach and manufacturer of the Wo We EMF protective products. Dr. Kruger, welcome. Good day or good evening for okay. us, and good day for other people wherever in the world you are. Um, I'm very happy and excited to share what we where we are in South Africa and what we are doing with all the challenges that you have already listened to. So yes, there are many, but surely step by step we are progressing. And especially if we are now 
um, getting more people on, um, working together, I'm sure it will um, become harder to just shut everyone down and say there's nothing to be worried about. So I want to proceed now with sharing a few slides um, where I will talk to um, and just give a little bit more information. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see. Yep, and, okay, great. So yeah, the International Children's Declaration, I am also very, very excited about it because it's actually um, taking all, not all, but almost all aspects of what the challenges are in our digital world or digital age for especially our children, but together it's families, it's parents, it's educators, because we are all together in this world with the wonderful um, opportunities for technology use, but also with all the challenges and the responsibilities coming together with that. And I think that's where um, the, our voice needs to become louder and to get together, I'm sure we must make a difference sooner than later. Um, I was always, or I think of digital smoke and many decades ago, I mean, smoke and the doctors, medical doctors even said, don't worry, it's all good for you. And I mean, we know what happened in the meantime. And mm -hmm. um, so with the benefit of the technology, on the other hand, we are now in a position to actually spread the word quicker. And um, six of the one and a half dozen, of, on the other hand, on the internet, people may get what they want to see, but to a large extent, if they know how humans are um, connected, how we are actually functioning with our cell biology, biochemical, bioelectrical, and the physics on the other hand, then surely um, just putting it together we must realize that it's almost common sense that it will have a negative impact on us mentally, physically, overall. And that's where our Techno LifeWise Foundation is coming in. Um, we have started um, in 2017 and we started most probably at that point in time with the internet addiction and the screen addiction, what's happening, video gaming, um, whatever you want to call um, the umbrella term, uh, it's all together with Techno, Techno LifeWise Foundation. And then we actually did um, the wait until grade eight as well, no cell phones at school, I'll get back to that and the other organizations and then what we um, think of doing in uh, next year. So um, just a brief, review of the internet addiction report that was um, released in January 23 and that put South Africa unfortunately not on the best foot because the global average according to that report um, in different countries it was more or less six hours 37 minutes but in South Africa, the average um, is closer to nine hours, 37 minutes. And that is not good news for, ons, for us thinking of what's happening in our environment. And I think it has a large, um, also largely to do with the fact that people would think they will be missing out, fear of missing out. But on the other hand, um, saying, just get more, give us more, we need more, and we don't know where are the boundaries to say enough is enough, because now it's actually not adding value and quality to our lives anymore, but it is diminishing our um, well-being, our humanity, 
in all areas of our lives. It's actually degrading us and making us and our children to a large extent dumber and number with all neurological and learning disorders on the screen addiction and video gaming addiction side. And then um, just to say that in South Africa, we do have a, a, quite a high number of penetration of the internet and a lot of the 46% of um, people using the social media um, is basically underage. Because if you think of uh, therefore wait until grade eight, um, uh, children are not supposed to be on the internet and social media platforms before they turn 13 and even WhatsApp 16. But that is not always or actually Many people are not aware of that and they are lying about their age and their parents are just ignorant or misinformed. So wait until grade eight. I know that in the USA, there's also wait until eight. A, a similar um, thing that has already started uh, quite a few years ago. In our case, we have launched it last year um, in 2022. Uh, as a challenge, we have structured it in another way so that more people from anywhere in South Africa, but in Africa or all over the world for that matter, can actually join it so that we can connect like-minded parents and so that they can support each other. So although it's a challenge, um, you will not, um, you don't, you can, we ask to sign and complete a form but it's basically to get like-minded parents together and in one community, when there's enough people, we can start meeting face-to-face. -face. So that is still a challenge to say yes, to delay the um, access to the internet and social media until at least to the age of 13. So many parents are agreeing on it, but it seems that they are just so bombarded by um, the telecom marketing people, the schools environment, the WhatsApp, the, it, it's as if they don't have a choice. Then we were also very excited by the UNESCO report this year, um, saying that, uh, supported by the Global Education Monitoring Report, that phones and tablets are more disrupting. It's actually uh, a distraction. And we have seen the notions on um, Sweden, for instance, Denmark, um, that the school performance it, of the children are lowering, their marks are not where they should be. And therefore, there are different countries who are already banning schools, um, tablets or phones in schools. So we also actually, together with one of um, the Roosevelt High School in Johannesburg. They have done that since uh, I think 2018, where no uh, high school with no cell phones um, at school and with a video clip on our website, the technolifewise.org, where you can watch the video. And that that's where the headmaster and teachers as well as children actually share how they are enjoying the fact that there are no phones at school and they can actually be human. They don't need to watch their phones all the time and all the pros and cons attached to that. So life is too short, too precious, and our children are too vulnerable not to pay attention to what's happening with them. Um, and sometimes it's too late when we realize that. Then just uh, Mary Ann, she was noting or sent this note earlier today to me. And I said to her, well, please go ahead. You're welcome, Ubuntu. And that's actually just to share um, that a healthy learning environment cannot be um, done unless human dignity of all members of that learning community is safeguarded. And that's going back to using Wi-Fi in schools, cell phone towers on um, school grounds, 
uh, just thinking of electro hypersensitivity, all the health aspects that's actually um, getting more and more and closer and closer to our children. So for South Africans, the idea of Ubuntu, that's I am because you are, in other words, we as people, we are sharing humanity and we are in the same community and we become what we are because of other people and interconnections and uh, engagement with each other in the real world. I think that's where our challenge is, is to celebrate and enjoy the real world with all our senses, all the wonderful capabilities and competencies that we have, but not only with moving a, screen, a finger on a screen and think that toddlers and babies can develop in the way that they should, uh, because that's where we are getting um, early addiction and already autism spectrum disorder, um, attention deficit disorder. So it's uh, a long, it's starting from actually with pregnant mothers already when we think of EMS. Um, so just to say that I am also a qualified radiographer. So although I've done my doctorate studies in psychology and education with the background of the radiography and the lead um, aprons that we use in the x-ray departments, for instance, um, that, that was actually after I've met the first electro-hypersensitive person, um, I started realizing that what's going on here. And more recently, about, about two months ago, um, I also did a presentation for the South African Society for Integrative Medicine, where there are a variety of health practitioners and medical doctors looking at the holistic person and the causes of what's happening with humans and people and children instead of just prescribing um, a pharmaceutical, uh, uh, giving a prescription, for instance. And then I reported on also research that I've done specifically um, with a live blood analysis and just to see what's happening with my red blood cells after, say, for instance, five minutes um, being exposed to a wireless uh, phone. And um, yeah, I, I think uh, the whole presentation, it's also for free download on the website of mindunique.co.za. And it was very interesting also to see linkages between long COVID and blood markers with um, the viscosity of your blood and the clogging of red blood cells and brain fog where our brain is actually not getting enough oxygen. And that is exactly what's happening when we are exposed to uh, wireless radiation as well. So after those that five minutes just on a 30 centimeter distance from the source, um, I walked I went outside and walked for five minutes barefoot on the ground. So that's where earthing came in. And um, uh, together with the homeopaths who are actually who were doing it together with me. Um, and then we went back and did the live blood analysis again. And then the red blood cells were starting to move again away from each other and not clogging so that there's not enough oxygen reaching our brains and our bodies. So thinking of that, and we know that our children are even more vulnerable um, because of their cells and their small bodies and bone structures and more liquid um, water in their bodies, um, we must be aware that um, there's actually no debate about it. And it's very sad to think that um, like in Germany, for instance, and other countries, and even in our country, I mean, um, the, it's just not recognized enough. And people are um, actually, yes, we get opportunities, I'll show you, but it's still not enough, but we will keep on going. Yeah, and then actually just to, 
um, confirm that this is the electrosmog meter that I'm also using um, to make, to do um, different measurements. And I just want to highlight the ElectroSmart app for Android phones, because that is actually also helping a lot for people who are uh, who don't have an ElectroSmart meter, but can still get an indication of what the levels of um, Wi-Fi as well as um, cell phone towers and other types of radiation in the environment. And then just to say, because of the lead aprons and all those kind of things that I was used to, uh, we designed actually now also the world, uh, while we standing for to create a world of well-being, EMF protected products, laptop shields, different aprons, cell phone pouches, an earthing um, screen as well, you know, or earthing mat actually. So there are different opportunities to share and to help people also to protect. And it seems that it's getting um, more and more people become aware of it and they become electro hypersensitive in, unfortunately. And also, yeah, increasing cancers. I mean, in South Africa, there was an increase of 25% over the last a decade from 28, I think, to 2018. And it's as if no one knows what's the difference, but actually it's not so difficult to realize that if our bodies are so electrosensitive and we are adding more electro pollution into our environments and our direct environments, it will have a negative impact. So just as a quick reflection, um, I've mentioned the SASM, um, South African Society for Integrative Medicine, where I, I have shared and keep on sharing because I'm also a member there. Um, the EMF SA, we also have smaller WhatsApp groups in that space. FEDSAS, um, I've contacted the Federation of Associations of Governing Bodies of South African Schools, and I said that we will follow up in 2024. Um, uh, to, to see what we can actually work on to raise awareness and empower teachers and educators and parents. I also have mail lists that we sent out emails um, to different schools in different um, provinces. Then uh, also the person, uh, one of the co-founders of the South African Teacher Wellbeing Initiative that has been established in September this year. So we will also work together and I'm sure that will all increase the networks and possibilities of sharing this um, children's declar declaration. The Independent Schools Association, um, as well as the Association for Christian Schools already uh, made some contact and I'm sure to get the people on board. I already had different opportunities, local and national radio, TV, internet, media interviews, um, each and every opportunity that we, from the foundation side or the individual that I can share, I've also had a, an opportunity to share this um, children's declaration uh, before the 20th of November, uh, before the International Children's Day. Um, so we will just keep on doing and keep on sharing and keep on opening opportunities. And then we plan from um, the TechnoLifeWise Foundation side to launch an association for digital well-being and neuroeducation um, in February 2023. So together with these organizations and other individuals who are um, shining and letting their lights shine. We want to get together and um, work in different areas to ensure that we are all on the same page. So just to confirm that the world is a dangerous place, but not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. But I'm sure we are not talking about the ones that are listening and the ones that are here now, but it's still the challenge of what we are, need to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. And uh, 
We've run out of time, unfortunately. We were planning to go for for 90 minutes and our time is up. So I'm not gonna have time for a lot of questions. I do have a couple of things to leave with you though. Um, we had someone ask about um, whether there's a plan to present this to local officials. That is the point of the, of the declaration is to allow activists and people all over the world to take this to their local school board, their local government, bring it to anybody that is in a position of making decisions around wireless RF. Um, that's really one of the primary purposes here. So don't be shy, print it out. Uh, on the website, you can print out a trifold. I don't have one with me, but it, it, we've, we've arranged it so it's easy to easy to print out on a, a threefold um, thing. It looks nice, easy to present to somebody so you don't have to, to have lots of paper. Anyway, uh, take a look for that on the website. You'll find it on the declaration page. Um, we had a question for everybody to think about for our next webinar, which is how do we get children and youth involved in this issue? I think it's a really good a good question and a really good thing for us to think about. Kids are not stupid. They, especially, you know, teenagers are very concerned about the environment, things that, in, that, in, that are in their food, in their clothing, in their atmosphere. They're concerned about global uh, climate change and other things. So uh, it's something that I want everybody to think about is how we might be able to do this. Before I go, I want to just put in a plug also for, uh, Marianne had mentioned techsafeschools.org. That is our website that just deals with RF radiation in schools. Uh, please go there and take a look. We are also the creators of the Baby Safe Project uh, in association with Deborah Davis at Environmental Health Trust. The Baby Safe Project has been translated into I don't know how many languages now. It's a very simple program to warn pregnant women not to put their phones in their pockets while they're pregnant or to use their tummies as shells for their wireless devices. I can't thank everyone. Julian, you got your hand up, but it's got to be quick. We got to be out of here in yeah, it's for me with lightning speed. I just want to make four points uh, within a minute. Uh, the first is I think it's apparent from all the presentations, which are really wonderful, of the commonality of legal, scientific, political issues. That is a basis for really some very imaginative, innovative work. Second of all, I was really touched by Eileen O'Connor's um, presentation of these children that have died. Uh, we should link our project in terms of a registry. There ought to be an international registry. Putting a human face to this suffering will be extremely powerful. So that I encourage us to have, consider that. Third, as I want to point out that adaptability and resilience are the greatest challenges, at least among them, of the age. We the, the, the world faces a plethora of extraordinary challenges to our ability to survive. And what we're ha what's happening here is we're disabling children's ability to be, to turn adversity to advantage, which is resilience. And finally, my last point is that you could see from uh, others' presentations about the power and how effectively, as Lorna has pointed out, ICNRP is playing this thing. So this presents to us an amazing collective for our whole community challenge, uh, an evolutionary challenge of how effectively to collaborate. There's an art and science and a body of uh, experience of how to organize networks with maximum power and effectiveness. And we should study it carefully as a common innovation evolutionary challenge, be able to design a response and leap and transcend what ICNRP is doing in a way that with the focus on protecting children as we've described today. I really am moved by this response and I deeply thank everybody here and you, Doug, for having taken the initiative and organized this. It's really wonderful. We really do have now a, a basis to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. I had the easy part. You guys did all the work. So thank you for your presentation. I can't begin to express my appreciation to all of you who prepared your presentations and shared your knowledge with this group. Um, we will plan a, 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 another webinar in the not too distant future, uh, but not until after the holidays are over. So in the meantime, I wish you all a happy holiday and a happy new year. And thank you all for attending. We'll see you soon. 